the Shelf. I'm your host, Yvonne Wolf. Today, our special guest is David Clow. He is a family therapist and the owner of Skylight Counseling Center. Welcome, David. Thank you. So, David, you're not crazy. Letters from your therapist. This is a great book title. Oh, How did thanks. you come up with this? Well, I, people actually have said to me, I'm, I'm a family therapist, so I work with individuals and couples, and people will say to me, do you think there's something wrong with me? Do you think I'm crazy? Is this crazy what I just did last week? And I, I think what they're asking is, am I normal? Mm -hmm. Is what I'm doing uh, typical? Because most of us don't have access into the lives of other people. And as a therapist, it's, a, it's really a privilege to know what goes on inside of people. So um, the book is meant to tell people that they're, the things that they do, the, the funny things they think, the behaviors that they have, they're kind of inconsistent, that that's, that's pretty normal, that yes. they're not crazy. Well, that's a very affirming, life-affirming yeah. yeah. <laughs> message to yeah. give. So tell us a little bit about the organizing of such a, big, such a book, because sure. you're, it's letters, it's in the form of letters, right. which is very personal. There's personal names in there, and of course you must have changed them. Yeah. Um, so how do you organize something sure. like that? Yeah, um, trying to figure out how to take some of the ideas or some of the themes that I see from people on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I wasn't sure how to get it out in, into the world. And uh, having the idea that maybe if I just wrote letters to my patients, mm -hmm. that that could be the vehicle to share some of the thoughts and ideas that uh, come up in pretty much every therapy session. Mm. Week after week, there, there's some common themes. So even though each person has their own story, yes. a, lot, a lot of people go through similar things like struggling with a breakup yes. or um, losing a job mm -hmm. or feeling depressed mm -hmm. um, and or, or their, their children having a hard time at school and then them feeling really anxious yes. and they often think they're the only one going through it. So one day after a pretty hard session I sat down and, and wrote a letter to one of the parents of, uh, or it was a client of mine who has a, a teenager who was really struggling. So I started writing her a letter and uh, just after the session, not sure if I was gonna share it with her or not. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up sharing it. She ended up appreciating that it was a letter yes. from me. Um, Cause you're right, it is more personal. Yeah. And then I just kept going with the letters um, really to kind of uh, help people with where they might be stuck. Yes. So there's letters to couples, mm. there's letters to men. Yes, I noticed yeah. that there, yeah. um, thematically. Yeah. And there's something like 12 themes, right? So there's, yeah. a, there's a lot of areas or lives you're touching on. Yeah, I, from, from starting out in therapy to people who are looking for love to people who are trying to find perspective. And then as the book goes on, it's more for... Um, people who are uh, experiencing uh, life changes that they don't quite understand and you know, kind of naturally towards the end, it's also kind of dealing with loss and end of life issues. So oh, yes. try to span the whole range if I can. So do you find that uh, you're getting more clients in one area or another, like distressing questions of loneliness or people say oh. that, that this um, age of social media making people feel more lonely. Yeah, I mean, that's the ironic part is people are feeling disconnected. And even if it's uh, uh, their, one of their closest friends or their partner, they may not really know what's going on inside the other person's heart or mind. So um, a lot of that uh, disconnection, I think, causes people to feel distressed it's hard for them to have compassion for themselves. Mm. It's really amazing to me how many people, their, their um, inner voice, how yes. they talk to themselves is kind of harsh or cruel. And so yeah. um, I try to work with people to be kinder to themselves in the, how they, their, their inner voice, how they talk to themselves. So, um, yeah, I think in this day and age where uh, some of the intensity on social media is ramping up, and you know, I'm noticing a lot of people feeling anxious and afraid. Yes. And um, the goal of the book was to try to reach more people to help them feel less uh, distressed. 
So tell us a little bit about, find, did you have an editor to help you with this um, format or the thematic, you know, which theme to choose? Um, it kind of came naturally out of my, my work. Yes, um, I can see. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's how it started. You know, the fantasy that I might have had that I was going to get a book deal and somebody was going to just kind of pay me to go and write, that didn't happen. This yes. was really just a labor of love um, to start. And then as it started to take shape, I, it started to feel like this could be a value. It'd be nice to get this out into the world. So um, I began the process of trying to find an agent, mm -hmm. a publisher. And that was, that was a really a learning curve for me to learn that industry. Yes, tell us a little bit about that because this sure. is a bumpy road to a publisher. Right? Yeah, and you have to have thick skin because there's a lot of not only just a lot of rejection, there's a, a lot of not, no responses back. So. Yeah. Um, what I did find useful was to learn how to query uh, publishers and agents. There's a particular way where mm -hmm. you um, send them an, an email proposing what your book is, and it, it, it's different whether it's nonfiction or fiction. Yes. Um, and if you have a book proposal, that is something that either uh, agents and publishers request. Mm -hmm. Often, if you go to their website, it'll say specifically how they want to be queried or approached. Mm, I so I spent <laughs> countless hours sending things out to agents and publishers that I thought would be a good fit for my field. Yes. Back to your question about editors, I did send the manuscript off to an editor that I hired myself mm -hmm. to try to clean it up and make it, you know, kind of who did uh, line editing and copy yes. editing oh, to really wow. tighten it yeah. up. Um, I quickly learned there's a lot of people in the writing field like that they call themselves book doctors yes. who will really help you pull together a theme and kind of help you workshop it and make it most presentable. I see. They don't guarantee that you're going to get an, an agent or a mm, publisher, no, no, yeah. but they can kind of help you pull together your idea and clean up the manuscript. So these, uh, so you were sending your manuscript to a editor at the right. same time you're looking for a publisher or after or what? Um, could both. I think yes. if I was to do it uh -huh. again I would have just gone to the editor, got it cleaned up as best, kind of come up with the best product I could mm -hmm. and then start um, approaching editors and publishers because some will then if they are interested say okay could you send the first um, 20 pages. 20 pages. Yes. And I, I want it to, f to be, I want to feel proud of those first 20 pages. <laughs> right, you know? right, not the so, ones you just worked on last night. That's correct? right, yeah. Yes. Okay, so this query, the publisher will tell you a format in which they want you to write to them, approach them. Yeah. So is that, is that different from publisher to publisher? Is that yeah. why it takes so much time? That's what took a lot of time because some want you to copy the first 20 pages into the body of an email, mm. some want an attachment, some want you to upload it through a different service online, I see. some just want a, a query letter. Yes. So you do need to go to their websites wow. mm. and uh, that makes it easier to be able to see what each publisher or agent is looking for on their website and then you um, would kind of follow their guidelines. So how long did you spend doing that? <laughs> and longer than long. writing the book? Um, about the same amount of time. Yes. Uh, so about a year oh, of, yeah. of trying to reach out. I went to a writer's conference, oh, yes, uh, yeah. which was really a, a lot of uh, workshops about how to get your book published and how to market yourself. And then they had something called speed pitching, where you had agents and publishers and you had 10 minutes to pitch your book. Yes. And I found that exhilarating to just kind of try to quickly say, here's what I'm writing and here's how it could be beneficial. And I got some good feedback about what was useful and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I think that the hard learning there was publishing is, a, is an industry where they're looking to, to sell books. Yes. And they want to know that the book's going to sell. I see. So do they help you with a title or anything like that? Because sometimes I feel titles, right? Catchy titles make yeah. a big difference in the covers. Yeah, yeah. Do they help you with those things? The agent that I ended up finding, which just came through a referral from a colleague, okay. um, supports uh, the field of mental health mm -hmm. and is interested in helping people who are uh, in, in, in the field of mental health who also have businesses to get their books out. So they're called Wyatt McKenzie Publishing. They're, they're in Oregon. And Nancy Cleary, who um, 
is in charge there, saw the book, believed in it, um, loved the title as it was, and it, it really, with all of those emails, and even those speed pitchings, it just took one person to oh, get say, it. Yes, just to get it, to say, to say yes, yes, right? Yeah, because mm. I was getting pretty close to, to moving towards self-publishing. Yes. Which is now, I think, in this day and age, really uh, a, a viable option. Um, people uh, can create their own press. Yes. And um, it's just a way to get one's book into the world. I don't think there's as much of a stigma around self-publishing as no, maybe there used of, to be. Yeah, most of our guests are self-published. It's a great way to get your book out there. Yes. And so you have a website so yep. did your publisher suggest this or is all on your own is it yeah um she helped with some ideas for it i enjoyed building it myself using a template which allows me to edit it but on the website is just simply um, some information about the book information about me as an author i did have a video mm -hmm. recorded and there's a video of me talking about the book and links to places to buy it so um, I wanted to have that all ready to go when the book launched. I see. So when I finally announced, like, here it is, it's being published, that people could easily go to the website and find out more about it and then direct them to places to buy the book. Well, I liked your website. I thought the website oh, was very clear. And Thank you. There's some very pertinent information that's easy to look through. And, and that is absolutely necessary right now, right, as an author? Yeah. And what they say people spend just um, a few seconds looking at a website, oh, you yes. know, so I think less is more, just a little bit about the book, an image of the book, and that they're maybe just going to click on one or two links and that's it. And your publisher didn't put you on a book tour. No. <laughs> so no. How, do you, yeah, how do you go about, right, this whole marketing of the book part I as know. an author, how do you do that? I'm learning, I'm figuring that out, certainly. <laughs> um, yeah, gone are the days where uh, a uh, publisher is going to send somebody on a book tour around the country, um, unless maybe they're very high profile, um, yes. or have, you know, or if it's a big publishing house. Yes. Um, and it, Lee Child still has to yeah, <laughs> yeah. when he comes to the United States, right? Sure. Yeah. But. So, um, and if, if even if you did have a publish, uh, a book tour, you might still be talking to a handful of people in some small towns around the country, and that's, that takes a lot of time and effort and money. Right. So I think how it is these days is that it's up to the, uh, up to the author mm. to promote their book. So um, I've been doing some talks where I will discuss the book, and, um, and I have to promote it myself. Um, the venue will help, but... Yeah. A lot of it is me getting it out there on social media and trying to reach potential readers. So which, um, which venues have you found for, your, yeah, for, you, for you to talk about or read your book yeah. aloud to people? Yeah, um, independent bookstores, I've found very satisfying to, to interact with them, to get my book e in there, even if it's on consignment, yes. that they might be willing to host me for a talk. So. Uh, City Lit Books in Logan Square is where I did my book launch event. Yes. It was it was really lovely. It was exactly what I was hoping to achieve that was comfortable and grounded and where uh, people who were, were interested in the book could come and hear more about it. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then a lot of it ends up being on online, yes. on social media. The conversations about it, yes. Yeah. So, they, so what two things would you recommend advice other writers to do to prepare for this launch event? Oh, for the launch event, yes. sure. Um, is a photographer absolutely necessary? Is it... Uh, it could help. Is yeah. it just a phone? I mean, do you... That's all we need? I think it depends on the book and who the author is and what their goals are, what they're hoping to do with it. Um, mm -hmm. So that might vary from person to person in terms of like what's the theme. If they were a young adult uh, novelist, um, that might look different in terms of how they launch it. Yeah. A fiction writer, it might be more character driven. Um, for me it was, I think regardless of what the topic is, it's um, get as much ready before you announce it. Because if it's, you start to get people who are interested, you want your website to be 
ready. You want people to be able to be directed to places to buy it. You want to, them to be able to contact you. Mm -hmm. um, maybe even be able to find a way to gather people's emails so that you can keep them update, updated. Uh, like yes. create a, a, um, a newsletter in terms of what you're up to, what your writing practices are. Because there are people who are really interested in what a writer is up to. Yes. So yes. you know you could create a newsletter that that lets people know what your projects are like. And this is all on top of your regular full time work. <laughs> well, that's the hard part for me, at least, is finding space and time to be able to create. You know, you need a blank canvas in order to do a painting. In order to write, you just you need some time. So I I struggled with that because I do work as a family therapist on a day to day basis. I, I run my practice, Skylight Counseling Center, and I manage my, my staff Team, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and do a lot of supervision. So th there wasn't a lot of time to write what, on, a, on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, what helped for me was to clear out uh, some, like a full week and take a week off. Ah. So one, uh, one at the end of the summer of the year I was writing the book, I. Uh, I took my motorcycle up to Wisconsin and I stayed in an artist cabin for 10 days and mm -hmm. there was no internet um, and, I, and I didn't get cell reception so okay. I just stayed up there and just wrote and wrote and wrote and then we'd go for walks and make a little bit of food and then write and write and write and for me that wow. helped um, to just have a big block of time. Is this a um, writer's boot camp or no? This no, is not the that same was thing. just my own little <laughs> retreat I did. Yes. But there are, yeah, there are places where you can go on like a writer's retreat. Yeah. And I researched some of that, but um, what was easiest for me was just to find a place to get away. That's true. So I could focus on writing. Well, that's probably healthy for all of our yeah. mental <laughs> wellness, uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> to just be unplugged that long and to yeah. and to think about. Yeah, I, I think we have to be intentional about it. Otherwise, like life just. All the demands fill me in on a regular basis. As much as I want to write now, mm -hmm. I'm caught up in emails and day-to-day -day administrative things. And so you, know. you, you mentioned social media. Does that play a role when you're looking for a publisher? Does your um, publisher expect you yeah. to have a social following already when yeah. you approach well, them? That, well, that's what I, it de I obviously depends on your uh, field and on the publisher. But that was my experience, especially wow. at that speed pitching uh, event at the conference, that they wanted to get a sense of my social media following. Wow, that to, is new to me. <laughs> I know. I mean, to me, <laughs> to too. To be asked. I yeah. know. I, I have not spent time building a social media following. Mm -hmm. Yet if you had... Uh, 100,000 followers on Instagram and you announced your book, there's probably more of a chance that a lot of those people are going to buy it. Yeah. So for a publisher, that's more of a sure thing. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was sobering to realize that they were less interested in the merit of the book mm -hmm. and more interested in uh, if I'm going to be able to sell it. Yes, and or whether you are um, showing potential to create a buzz and continue that. Right? Exactly. So wow. maybe somebody who's on a reality TV show. Yes. Oh, might, yes, those are people. Yes. They might have yes. a big following or, if they wrote a book. Yes, yeah. or American Idol, those kind of programs. Yeah. yeah. The, wow. Yeah, there's probably more people who would jump to buy that book. Mm. Um, and so then it, I felt it's really on me to try to um, educate people about the goal of, of, of the book, um, yes. which is really to, to reach people and help them. Right, right. To, yeah, to um, time have time for reflection, right, rather than the the busyness. Yeah, right? to like to look inside. Right. And for a lot and of us, introspection. We, yeah, it, it, a lot of us, it's hard to look inside. When we start looking inside, it, it's not always comfortable. So, my my work on a day to day basis is to help people feel comfortable looking inside themselves. And saying something nice. <laughs> and saying something nice <laughs> right. to themselves when they see it. Yes. Right. Right. Or when they do look. Um, and then the book hopefully guides people to do the same. So what sort of feedback have you gotten, David, from your readers? How does that work out? Yeah, I, I, people have been using the book in interesting ways. Because it's, it's letters, and the sh letters are sometimes just a couple of pages long, um, it, people haven't necessarily just been reading through. Some have, but I've heard from people who just pick a letter a day and will kind of um, find what speaks to them based on the, the topic. 
So um, my hope is that somebody would even just kind of grab a letter, read it, you know, before their day or after, at the end of their day or, or while they're commuting, and it might help them cultivate a little more depth and a little more connection to yes. themselves and the world. Um, but and, yeah, and maybe even build some empathy with someone yeah. they take a peek at. Yeah, I had uh, a therapist who read the book, and mm -hmm. she started using the letters with her clients. So oh. she would she shared a letter with her client, and they talked about the themes. Uh, the client found it to be a relief that uh, it felt like it was a letter to her. Yes. Um, so it helped her feel less alone. And um, I have some ideas about using the book also to help new uh, clinicians, new psychologists and therapists to yes. help them train and think about how to work with people. Well, those are all very good practical uses, yeah. and I think it will be great for our social change. Yeah, that, yeah, um, that, that's the idea. I really think that um, where I see things going and maybe what I might try to hopefully write about in the future is um, the way that uh, art and science can come together yes. and um, be merged rather than separate. Um, uh, and how we can take our relationships and make them um, more healthy, more conscious. Um, I, I think kind of the next wave of human development is, is having uh, healthier relationships, and we're all kind of trying to figure that out and, and learn that um, uh, in this day and age. So tell us a little bit about your connection to Glenview, because you were a uh, Glenbrook South coach yeah yeah um, I used to coach basketball and um, uh, that was uh, it still is basketball's real joy of mine um, and I, I used to um, run uh, uh, Glenview uh, the, the feeder basketball teams I ran those for a couple of years and for both boys, for and, boys girls, right? and girls yeah. and um, it was really great to see the families come together around uh, the team and to support the community. And for me, working with those families yes. uh, through basketball really is what turned me on to family therapy because I would see how uh, the, the families were sometimes um, improved from their child growing. Yes. And I got some feedback from a parent who said that you know, because my son's been on your team, he's better at home. It's really helped him to be mm. on your team. It's helped our whole family. Right. And for me, the bells and the buzzers went off, you know, and to... This was gratifying. Yeah. yeah. And to maybe um, take basketball out of the way and just work directly with families yes. uh, was, became my, my goal. But that is part of the intention, right? If you go into basketball with some intention of being a better family relations with each other? Yeah, I think the, the I really enjoyed the relationships with my players mm -hmm. and with the um, with the families and that was the most satisfying thing. The winning and the losing was yes, not as important, especially with youth, youth athletics. Right, um, and those are actually good um, experiences, right, to, to um, to grow from yeah. instead of hanging on those yeah. uh, wins or losses. Right. Did this inspire you to become a family therapist? Yeah, yeah. Um, working with the families, yeah. um, uh, seeing people grow, um, seeing them change when it came to how they handled loss or mm. adversity, yes. or their temp you know, if their temper, a kid gets really upset if he doesn't do well, or the mm. parents are upset that the child is not playing as much. Um, right. you know, th their expectations uh -huh. are showing on the court side. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, I experienced the, fa the Glenview families as passionate, but they also had good perspective that this was... Um, you know, supposed to be fun. Yeah. That's that's really the goal of why we play sports is because it's supposed to be fun. Yeah. Um, when you do better, it's more fun. But yeah. um, it's a healthy emotional engagement. Yeah, <laughs> and you meet people from mm. all different walks of life. You know, I I have a lot of buddies who maybe I never would have encountered because we come from different backgrounds. Who where where sports brought us together. So I think it's a good uh, activity that that kind of helps people from diverse backgrounds join. Well, that's very interesting. Well, with that thought, thank you very much, David. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me here. And thank you for watching. Join us next time on Off the Shelf.